Welcome back once again, everybody, to the adventures of Odysseus. Now, of course, Odysseus has been through quite a bit up to this point. He sacked Troy, being the mastermind behind the conception of using the Trojan Wars. But, as with all great efforts, sometimes there are great consequences. In the great sea god, the Earth Shaker, Poseidon, was one of the gods that built the walls of Troy, and he was angered by Odysseus. So he flung him off to a faraway isle, where he had to dodge the lotus eaters, outwit the cyclops. He had to elude and defend him and his men against the enchantment of Circe. He had to he had to swoon Aeolus and earn his respect dine with this god of the wind, and he almost made it home if it weren't for his preventing his men from knowing what was in that pouch that Aeolus gave him, and due to their, as humans tend to be full of, their curiosity, they opened the pouch just in sight of Ithaca, and it was wind, it was a west, an east wind, sorry and drove them west, a wind coming from the east. It drove them all the way back. So from here, they came back to Circe's enchanted isle, where Circe had, uh, he had earned Circe's trust and companionship. So she once again gave him advice and told him how, how he was to be able to sail through the, the great walls of Italy and Sicily. And here the Scylla and Chartus dwell. Now the Scylla is a great monster who picks off men from the ships that passed too close to the shoreline, but they were forced to pass close because the Charmedis sucks great swaths of water, making whirlpools that would suck entire ships down to the bottom. So Odysseus chose to save all his men by sacrificing, to save some of his men, rather, by sacrificing a few to the Scylla as they passed by. And of course, Odysseus, being the brave and curious and cunning man he is, before they went there, he knew they would have to pass the sirens with their beautiful, alluring chants. And because of Circe's warnings, he heeded them and knew he would be mesmerized. So he told his men wittily to plug their ears with wax while he had them tie himself up to the mast of the ship. As we see, as we see here in this great picture, while he had the pleasure of listening to their deadly, lovely voices, and we could see here in the picture of the women, the sirens, the man-eaters, the bones of the former victims that fell prey to their lovely croons. So they made it to Sicily. And when they shored up on Hyperion's castle, he had many, many, many flocks of sheep. But due to the warnings of Tiresias, who he consulted with in Hades. He knew not to meddle with any more of the gods, 
or their flocks, the things they watched over. So, while he and his men tried their best to go hungry after a month, and their supplies dwindling down to near nothing, one night while Odysseus was asleep, his men slaughtered some of the god Iberian's cattle. And from this, they were whisked off to sea, and their boats were destroyed. And Zeus was responsible, but only because his loyalty to the gods before the men, despite pitying Odysseus. So all his men died in the great thunderbolts and black, black, terrible storms that Zeus created to punish them for eating the gods' cattle. And now all Odysseus has is himself clinging, floating for nine days and nights in the salt sea until he came upon the Isle of Calypso, whereupon she essentially held him captive for seven years as a man worthy of becoming a god and being the husband of a goddess. But he wasn't happy. Odysseus spent seven long, lonely years sitting on top of cliffs, staring out to sea and weeping at his fate. So, while Poseidon was down in Africa, accepting sacrifices, Athena thought Odysseus has been through enough and been honorable the whole time. He's been a truthful, honest, brave, courageous, witty, clever man. And he's done his best to keep his men safe, despite them all drowning. So she took it upon herself to ask Zeus for some vouchsafing of Odysseus, and now has guided young Telemachus. Athena, in the guise of Mentes, one of Odysseus's old friends, was at the side of young Telemachus, shaping the boy into a man and strengthening his resolve to find his father and defy the suitors who were disgracing and disrespecting Odysseus's and island and kingdom. So it's been a while, Penelope, Odysseus' wife, is trying her best to keep the suitors at bay, doing witty things, such as promising them her choice of one of them in marriage as soon as she finishes a tapestry honoring Odysseus in Troy. Yet every night while they get drunk and lose their wits, she discreetly undoes most of the work she had done that day, buying her much time. And by this time Telemachus is old and older, rather, and has grown almost into a man, at least in physical appearance. And that's where Athena comes in. With the help of Athena and the guises mentees, Young Telemachus is spurned on for into action to defy the suitors and take back what is rightfully his and his father's. So Zeus now is going to help Odysseus escape Calypso's Isle by sending a messenger, Hermes. Hermes sped across the waves with his golden wand that brings sweet sleep or dispels it, and his golden sandals that carried him like Athena swiftly through the air. He dipped and soared above the waves, exulting in their spray, their salty spray. He found Calypso in her cave, singing softly and weaving at her loom with that golden shuttle. 
you here, Hermes. I am commanded by the all-powerful Zeus to tell you to release luckless Odysseus. It is not his destiny to remain with you. He must build himself a raft to take him to the land of the Phaeacians. They will furnish him with a ship back to Ithaca, his home. Oh, cruel Zeus, cried Calypso. I rescued this man from the sea when Zeus had shattered his ship with a thunderbolt. I offered him immortality to live with me and love me in this enchanted place, and now I must let him go. Who, who will I find then to be my companion? Nevertheless, Calypso had to obey the command of Zeus. She went in search of Odysseus and found him, as usual, sitting by the shore gazing out across the sea to where Ithaca lay. The deathless gods have taken pity on you, Odysseus, she said. I am to let you go. So if you wish, you may cut down trees and I will give you tools to make a raft to carry yourself across the sea. I will provide you with food and water and wine, but think I beg you of the sorrows and the hardships that must lie ahead. You have a choice. Only forget your family, and you can live here with me in eternal bliss. You have a heart to pity me, said Odysseus, but I have not one to love you. My love is already pledged. I will endure any hardship if I can return to Ithaca. So Odysseus started work at once, building his raft. He felled twenty trees and shaped them with a bronze axe. He pinned the timbers together to make a raft and built half a deck on it. He then raised a mast and fitted a steering oar and fenced the sides with plated willows back, backed with brushwood. After four days the raft was ready. So at dawn the next day, Calypso bade him farewell. She gave him provisions for his journey and a fair wind to help him on his way. And she watched him far, far into the distance. Now and then the breeze brought her some lively snatch of a sailor's song that Odysseus was singing in his high spirits. She even buried the she buried even these sad fragments deep in her heart to treasure through the lonely years to come.
Calypso was not the only god to hear Odysseus singing, Earthshaker Poseidon, who spans the earth, also heard that merry voice as he returned from Ethiopia. Who has dared to do this? He bellowed. This man has not yet paid for his crimes against me, and Poseidon summoned a raging tempest to stir up the waves. Odysseus clung to his raft while it was flung hither and thither by the squalling winds and deep, rolling seas. But there was one to take pity on him. Eno, who was once a mortal woman, but now lives in the sea, rose from the waves like a gull and settled on the raft. Poor man, she said. Poseidon's anger will destroy you if you try to fight him. You must strip off your clothes and trust yourself to the sea, leaving this unlucky raft to its fate. Here, take this scarf. You can swim from here to the island of the Phaeacians, and the scarf will keep you safe from drowning. But once you reach the shore, cast it into the sea so that it will return to me. Odysseus grasped the scarf and flung himself into the waves with only a single plank to cling to. For two days and nights, Odysseus rode the waves until exhausted and near the end of his strength. He reached the rocky shore of the land of the Phaeacians. The rocks tore the skin from his hands as he clutched them. With his last strength, he flung Inos, 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 I guess, precious scarf back into the sea. And then a wave caught him and threw him onto the beach. He lay there, a broken man with salty brine pouring from his mouth and nostrils. And as Odysseus lay bruised and battered on the Phaeacian shore, Athena sealed his eyes with the sleep. Then the goddess went to the palace of King Alcinous and to the bedside of his daughter Nausicaa, a lovely girl in the first flush of beauty. The goddess whispered, she should take a wagon down to the washing place near the sea to launder all her fine clothes in preparation for the ceremony. So the next day, Nausicaa and her maids went down to the washing place. They took a basket full of fine foods and wine in a flask of soft olive oil to rub into their skin after bathing, for they intended to make a holiday of it. The girls washed the clothes and laid them to dry by the sea's edge. Then they bathed and anointed themselves with the olive oil, and afterwards they played at catch, tossing a ball from one to the other to the rhythm of Nausicaa's singing. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm.
threw too hard, and the ball went into the sea with a splash, and they all shrieked. That was Athena's signal. She caused Odysseus to wake. He staggered out from behind the bush that had hidden him. With only a bow wrenched from the underground to cover his nakedness. To the girls he seemed like some wild creature and they fled from him. Only Nausicaa stood her ground, for Athena had filled her with courage. Odysseus said, Fair lady, if you are a lady and not a goddess, have pity on me. Tell me, what land is this where I've been cast ashore? This is the country of the Phaeacians. I am Nausicaa, daughter of the king, Alcinous. You are welcome, stranger, for though you look rough, your words are gentle. Bathe, dress, and come with me to my father's palace, and he will give you all that is due to a guest. For Zeus himself, Zeus himself is the patron of the wayfaring stranger. Alcinous welcomed the castaway with great kindness. He could see that this was no ordinary man. Indeed, Athena cast such a glow about Odysseus that he seemed like one of the immortals. And here we have King Alcinous giving Odysseus some clothes, a warp, wardrobe. Tell me, what can I do for you? said the king. Give me a ship to take me home, answered Odysseus. It shall be done, said Alcinous. But first you must recover from your ordeal. Go and rest now, and tomorrow I will prepare a ship to take you wherever you wish. In your honor, I will hold a great banquet and games in which our younger men can show you what we Phaeacians are made of. Next day Odysseus, who had still not told Alcinous his name, sat in the place of honor at the feast. When everyone had eaten and drunk their fill, Demodocus, the blind bard, took down his lyre. Athena inspired him to sing of heroes, and the story he chose told of the quarrel between Odysseus and Achilles outside the walls of Troy. Odysseus drew his cloak over his face so that no one should see the tears that ran down his cheeks. Then Alcinous announced the start of the games. The young Phaeacians vied with one another running, wrestling, jumping, and throwing the discus, each hoping to impress the noble stranger with their strength and skill.
the best of them was named Euryalus. And this young man approached Odysseus, saying, now, 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 now it is your turn to show us what you are made of, for no one can be called a man unless he excels at some sport or other. I have no taste for such things today, Odysseus said. My heart is aching to be home. Euryalus sneered. You speak like some penny-pinching merchant, whose only pleasure is to count the goods in and out of his warehouse, not like a man of spirit, Odysseus said. The gods do not give all their blessings to one man. You have the body of a young hero but an empty head. Once I too was young and strong, but I have suffered much through the malice of the gods. Yet even now I will accept your challenge at any sport, even running, though I have been sorely battered by the waves. So Euryalus picked up a discus and threw it as far as he could. Beat that, he said. Odysseus rose and took a discus. As he swung back his cloak, the crowd gasped at the corded muscles of his upper arm. He threw and the discus sailed powerfully through the air, far outstripping Euryalus' throw. I'm afraid my strength is not what it was, said Odysseus, and everyone laughed except Euryalus. Then King Alcinous called for dancing, and the moment was forgotten. When the dancing was over, Odysseus asked if the bard Demodocus would sing again, and Demodocus sang of the deeds of Odysseus and Menelaus at the sack of Troy. Once more glittering tears welled up from Odysseus' eyes. When the story had come to an end, he said, Alcinous, you have done me every honor and given me many gifts, and have not so much as asked my name. So now I will tell you, I am Odysseus, son of Laertes. Since the fall of Troy, I have been wandering the seas, buffeted by fate and the gods, from one horror to the next. But now, with your help, I hope to reach my home at last. Your ship is ready, replied Alcinous, and you need have no fear of shipwreck. We Phaeacians use no steering oars for our ships respond to the very thoughts, our very thoughts, and skim across the waves with ease and grace. Your long journey is coming to its end. Farewell, Odysseus. the day with humility.